hello and welcome. My name is Michelle Martin, and I am an admissions representative for the DeVos Graduate School at Northwood University. My role is to guide you through the admissions process and act as your advisor throughout this enrollment process. Our agenda for today is as follows. We're going to hear from a current faculty member who will speak on creating a positive culture, even if you're not the boss. We'll have an overview of Northwood University's graduate school programs. We'll go over the admissions process programs, and we'll also have a question and wrap up session. If you do have any questions, please feel free to type them in on the right hand side of your screen where I will be answering them during and after our presentation. So let's go ahead and get started. We are very pleased that you're investing your time today to learn about the partnership with Michigan Public Health Institute and Northwood University that offers you to advance your career. We see education as an investment that has a great return on investment. While Northwood University and MPHI's partnership is new, we have been partnering with industry for decades to ensure that what you are learning in the classroom has direct application to what you are doing professionally. We have a 50 year plus history of educating industry and our mission is that we are developing the future leaders of a global free enterprise society. At this time, I'd like to turn it over and introduce you to Dr. Todd Thomas, who is the Associate Academic Dean and a professor here at DeVos Graduate School. He's been with us for 10 years, coming from the automotive industry, where he was an executive with Mercedes-Benz. Dr. Thomas has worked with thousands of leaders in over 20 countries on issues of leadership and change, and is focusing this morning on creating a positive culture, even if you are not the boss. Dr. Thomas, I turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Michelle, and welcome to everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm going to take just a few minutes on a topic that is one that, um, as Michelle mentioned, I've been doing this for a long time, and and this is a topic that is um, quite popular to people because the question often comes down to who changes culture and who makes culture happen. Um, the title is actually a little bit misleading because uh, it assumes that if you are not the boss, then perhaps it, it's um, harder for you to, to change the culture. But the fact is that the boss actually can't dictate a culture. Um, managers and leaders can easily uh, get in the way of positive culture from somebody here who is a, a manager. Um, <clears throat> but it truly is the community of the organization uh, that decides what the culture is going to be. So you can have an impact. Um, and actually the only way for your, your culture to be a positive culture is that you do have an impact. So let's talk for a moment about why culture is important. One of the things uh, from some research done by Queens College and also some repeated research done by the Gallup organization is that organizations with positive cultures um, have measurable outcomes. For one thing, they have 26% less employee turnover. They have 100% more unsolicited employment application. Now that's a cool and interesting statistic that not many people hear very often, um, but organizations with positive cultures have people who are applying for positions even when positions aren't posted because they really want to work there. And typically, they may want to work there because of what the company does, but what's driving them to apply is how the company is, the culture of the company and how what it's known for. Uh, there's 20% less absenteeism in positive culture. 15% uh, greater productivity, and then 30% greater customer satisfaction as measured by um, these uh, outputs that, that Gallup and the Queens College have both followed. So we could talk about culture for a long time, and in fact, we have courses that are specifically about organizational culture. But I'm going to focus in on one thing, and that is how culture is defined because culture is defined by rules. If you stop and think about it, um, whatever culture you identify with, let's say uh, it could be an ethnic culture, it could be a religious culture, it could be your family culture uh, or work culture. That culture is defined by a set of rules. We do some things, we don't do others. Uh, we do things in a certain way, we treat people a certain way. 
And in most organizations, there are a set of rules that are pretty explicit. So let's say, for example, just to make it simple, that in your organization, there is a rule that you must clock in by 8 a.m. <clears throat> now, you would think that that rule is so straightforward that it has nothing to do with culture. But in many organizations, there is this second set of rules, and they're hidden away. They're in the safe. You don't get to see them. Uh, but you learn them very quickly. And in this case, it might be that you must clock in by 8 a.m. unless you're one of the boss's family members. Well, nobody's going to tell you that when you first start working there. You're going to find that out. And as you find that out, you put that away um, as one of the elements of the culture. Why do we care if the boss's family members don't have to clock in? Well, the rule that we actually see then is that some people are privileged, and that can negatively impact a culture. Uh, the important part being that we all understand it, whether anybody says it out loud or not. So there are some common causes uh, for poor culture. Um, and yes, I'm uh, one of the diehards that continue to use Dilbert strips. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and one of those common causes is a lack of appreciation of culture and acknowledgement of what the culture is. So um, in, in our setting at the DeVos Graduate School, um, we speak very much, and Michelle mentioned this, that our goal is to create the, the future leaders of a global free enterprise society. So that's part of our culture. That's part of how we focus. That's part of how we work. There's personal accountability that relates to that. And so that's part of our culture as well. And these are things that if you're here, you begin to understand after a while. And we're going to tell you that that's the case, but it's not going to mean anything um, until you feel it and, and you see that that is an appreciated part of the culture. The second cause of poor culture is outdated, and I'm just going to say, or just stupid rules. Um, and some of those can be pretty amazing um, and pretty obsolete. So it may be, uh, well, actually one uh, area of this is often work from home opportunities. And uh, it may be that you work in an environment where working from home or a flexible schedule uh, could easily be accommodated. But the culture may believe that if you work from home, you're a slacker. You would like to think that by now that doesn't exist in any organizational culture, but it does. I'm not saying that all cultures can have flexible work hours, but simply this idea that the rule is still there, even if there are so many ways that it could be circumvented for the satisfaction of the employee and ultimately the satisfaction of the customer. The third cause of poor culture is an interesting one, and that is underskilled and overmanaging supervisors. And here's how this works. Um, typically, if I am, let's say, an accountant, and I am an outstanding accountant, well, at some point, I'm going to get promoted to the supervisor of the accountants because that's really the only way to reward me for my hard work and to increase my salary and so forth. Well, if I do that job okay, I may actually end up being a department head for accounting. The problem is that along the way, nobody taught me how to manage people. I'm just a really good accountant. So the, the response to that is typically over-management. And it's not necessarily over-management because the supervisor believes everyone that works for them is stupid. It's over-management because they don't know how to manage. And of course, the results of this is that it perpetuates itself and becomes a negative aspect of the, um, of the organization. In some organizations, a focus only on sales and profits is a problem. And by that, I mean lack of a focus on the human being. We all know organizations where big egos are one of the problems. And so that ability to uh, make the culture what I want it to be um, can negatively impact everybody else. And if I truly believe that because of who I am or the position I have, that you should respond, um, it, it very often creates a negative environment. And then finally, lack of transparency. Uh, neither you nor me nor anybody else likes to work in an environment where we feel like we just don't know what's going on. So 
just a few more minutes here. Let me talk about the specific things, excuse me, the specific things that you can do to improve your culture and in fact, uh, to reinforce a positive culture, even if you have that. Uh, these are things not, not only that you can do, but that you should do. And I think you'll find that, that these can make a difference uh, in many cases right away. For one thing, start from where you are. If your culture is very hierarchical, if your culture is uh, very autocratic, or even if your culture is very open and transparent, don't try to make changes as if it's not. Accept where it is and look for those things that you can actually impact. That means focusing on the critical few. We can't change everything in a culture, but we can change some things. And so, for example, when I talked about the flexibility and the flexible hours, maybe we can't change all attitudes about different work environments, but we might be able to impact this with a slight change in um, starting and ending times and letting employees decide when, you know, within a range when they, they'll come and leave work. Little steps like that, um, if that is your focus, will help adjust the culture to the direction you want. Also, reach across silos. You sit in a department, you sit in a group that you could probably impact the culture right away, but for an organizational culture to happen, it has to be beyond your department and beyond your division and beyond your you know, uh, specific work. Um, if you feel there are areas of the culture that need to be changed or need to be improved, it's likely that other people in other areas believe that as well. So reaching out to colleagues, asking them what they're doing, suggesting to them what you're going to do, uh, can really take an individual action and make it an organizational one. And then finally, make the rules explicit. The problem with the unwritten rules is that we don't change them because nobody talks about them. So sometimes what's necessary is to bring them up. When I do this in a, a workshop setting, and especially when I do this for a specific company where all of the people are from that company, uh, this is one of my favorite spots because I usually ask, so what are your unwritten rules? And of course, nobody speaks because they're not comfortable saying uh, the rules that they believe to be true. The only way to really change things is to bring it up, to, to point it out. Um, to make it something you can discuss and a problem you can solve. So if you work from current, there is something that is about as simple as it could possibly be, and that is creating a positive culture through simply being kind and grateful with everybody. Even if, if you're a manager and, and people work for you, keep in mind they're choosing to work for you. Even if this were a time of poor uh, employment options, they're still making a choice. And so we need to have some level of gratefulness at the fact that we have the group that we have. We have people who are willing to be a part of this team and this culture. Um, and there's zero reason not to be kind. Um, I, I actually speak on that a lot in some other contexts. Uh, but there's really no excuse to not be simply nice uh, to each other. That can make a huge difference, and that's something that you can catch yourself uh, paying attention and, and wondering, was that was I really kind in that interaction, or was I self-centered? And next time I need to be kind, and I bet that will have a difference. Positive talk fits in with this. Um, one of the things that uh, people get a lot of comfort from is feeling like a victim and then joining a bunch of other people who feel like victims, um, because it feels like if we complain together, uh, we have done something. Well, we have. We've contributed to a negative culture, um, and we've contributed to each other's misery. Um, so uh, you can try to insist on other people uh, and positive talk, but the one thing you can do for sure is make sure that your talk is positive. If you have a problem with somebody, speak to that somebody, um, but make it a rule that you don't complain and that you don't especially talk about other people um, in a negative way to your colleagues. I promise you that this will not only make a difference, but others will start to emulate that particular approach. Support them when they do. Uh, when someone is challenged with a problem, remember that, that you know, even if we think that uh, something is happening that is just the stupidest thing we've ever seen, 
to the people who are doing this thing, they actually don't believe that it's a stupid thing. So give some thought to why would you think this is a good thing? And maybe what I need to do is to support you rather than fight you. Um, again, when we have those kinds of productive discussions and we start to understand why people are doing what they're doing, we can find ways to support them. And then finally, lead laterally. Um, all groups look for leaders, um, even in, in small task force or committees or whatever. Uh, leaders are important. You can lead your peers through the behaviors that you choose and through the ways that you approach positive culture. I can tell you here as we wrap up that if there is anything that can make a difference in your work life and the work life of your colleagues in a very short period of time, it is to consider doing just some of the things on this particular chart. And most of these are well within your power to do. Other people will notice and when they notice and they ask you about it, tell them, this isn't really a culture I wanna work in where we're to always talking about people. I wanna work somewhere that, we, that we're positive. You'll find that, that that actually is the opinion of many, and when they see your leadership, they're likely to follow. Now, this is a section uh, that we use in some of our classes. Uh, it, this was a very short part of it. I hope that you have found some uh, part that you can use. Uh, if you were part of one of our programs, you would find that we get very much into this idea um, of business, both from a technical standpoint, but also from um, a, a, a person standpoint. And when we work with organizations like yours, we try to make sure that we understand so that we can relate it directly to the work that you do. We're all about application. We look for ways that you can apply this. So thank you for attending, thank you for listening, and Michelle, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Thank you so much again for that amazing presentation. So right now we are going to talk briefly about the programs that DeVos Graduate School offers. So our current academic programs, we offer a Master's of Business Administration, an MBA, which has a broad business acumen. We do have a simulation capstone course at the end of the program, and this program is delivered in three different formats. We have an accelerated program completed in one year's time. We have our working professional program, which is one class, one night a week in the evening, and takes 24 months to complete. And then we also offer this program online. Similar to the working professional, it is one class at a time, delivered over 24 months. Our next program is our Master of Science in Organizational Leadership, MSOL for short, and this is a management and leadership acumen. This is delivered mainly online, but for those of you attending that are in the Lansing area, it is also offered as a hybrid format, so you have the ability to meet face-to-face -face at our Lansing location. Our last program is our Master of Science in Finance, MSF, that focuses on risk management, accounting, and economics, and it does prepare you for the CFA. This is delivered online. So we'll go a little bit more into those program details. Our MBA program is 36 credit hours, while the MS programs, the MSOL, and the MSF are 30 credit hours. They are delivered in eight week courses, whether it's on ground or online. There is a little bit of a tuition difference based on your program. Our current cost for the 2019-2020 school year, the MBA program is $37,080, while both MS programs are $23,970. We do offer a 15% partnership discount on any program through your organization, so that's wonderful. Our next available start semester is our spring semester of January 13th. <coughs> also have a late start in the spring, which begins on March 16th. Now, after learning about our programs offered, you may be asking yourself, what's next? <coughs> and that's our admissions process. The first step is to complete the online application, which, as you can see on your screen, is available at apply.northwood.edu. And again, we have a fee waiver for our MPHI uh, employees. So that $50 application fee is waived by using the code NUCEP. After the online application is completed, you will need to submit all official transcripts from any previous colleges and universities you've attended, 
a bachelor's degree is required as part of the application process for our graduate program. You will also have to submit your current resume. You can do that right online with your online application. And the final step is to interview with an admissions representative, probably me as I have been overseeing this program. And I would also like to point out that the GMAT and GRE are not required for any of our programs. The MBA, MSOL, or MSF, it is not required. So that is the step for the admissions process. If any of those programs are something that you would like to learn more about, you can always reach out to myself. Uh, there is my email and my phone number. I am happy to answer any questions. I understand that today you might not have had a question pop up, but maybe after today's uh, event has ended, you might think of something you want to know about. Please feel free to reach out and ask. We want to thank you at this time for attending our webinar. And we do offer the opportunity still to type in questions. We can hang out for a few minutes if you still have those questions. You will be receiving an email with my contact information. And as a reminder, that spring semester is coming up January 13th. It is not too late to apply for that. I want to again thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Thomas, for speaking on an amazing topic.